Hi everybody, welcome to part two of our series on building looks. In our first video, we got off to a great start by setting an overall contrast curve, and today we're gonna to refine that curve by adding some split toning to it, which is really gonna to start to bring our look to life by adding color separation and depth. Let's get into it. So let's pick up where we left off in part one, where we were drawing the contrast curve component of our overall look. And if you recall, we were doing that work not here at the clip level, but rather at the timeline level where we can know that whatever adjustments we make, whatever nodes we create are going to have the same effect on all the images in our timeline, which is obviously the entire point of a look. We want a set of consistent adjustments under which we can make individualized grades, but that give us a consistent overall aesthetic and set of guidelines that marry all of the disparate images together. And if we look here, my contrast curve that we set in part one is still right where we left it. I've got my black point set, my knee, my shoulder, and my white point. And this is the net effect of that contrast curve. It's giving me a good baseline of contrast that spans across all of my images and under which I can make my individualized adjustments when the time comes. Today, we're going to refine this contrast curve further by adding something called split toning. What is split toning? Simply put, split toning is pushing cooler colors into the shadow regions of your frame and warmer colors into the highlight regions of your frame. Why do we do this? There's a couple of reasons. First, our eyes naturally perceive cooler colors as being further away and warmer colors as being closer up. So by making our darker portions of our frame cooler and the brighter portions of our frame warmer, we're naturally creating depth. We're naturally giving the eye priority and foregrounding things that are at middle to upper exposure while allowing things that are more toward the bottom, more in shadow, to recede in our visual system. So it's one way of creating a good sense of depth and dimensionality. The other primary reason is that split toning tends to create additional color separation, meaning the contrast between the dominant colors in our frame. So those are the two things that I'm really gonna be looking for out of this split toning operation and that are gonna really help elevate my look and give me a foundation on which we can continue to build for the rest of this series. Now, I've done my work so far here in my custom curves, and if I wanted to, I could do everything that I just described right here within this same node, within this same curve graph that I have going on right here, simply by unganging my channels. And I could begin to go into my individual color channels and say, lift up this control point just in the blue channel to get a little more blue in the shadow region. And then lift up this control point here in the red channel to get a little bit more warm color in the upper regions but I don't necessarily want to break apart and start to mess with what I'm getting in terms of baseline contrasts out of this current curve. I don't really wanna mess with it. And the way this interface works, it can get a little touchy, especially when we begin to fine tune. So my preference is to leave this exactly as is and to work in a new node upstream of, to the left of this baseline contrast node and this is where I'm gonna do my split toning, starting with a unity curve here, which will then feed into this custom curve node here. It's gonna be the same net effect, but it means I can audition these components individually, and I have more ability to control one without inadvertently bumping the other. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've got my new node that I've prepended to my curve node here, and I'm gonna go in and ungang my channels like so, because I wanna manipulate them individually. So I'm gonna start with my blue channel here, and I'm gonna look at the bottom portion of the image, and I'm gonna draw my first control point somewhere in that zone, toward the very bottom, and I'm gonna nudge it up because I wanna add blue into this area. I'm gonna go quite a healthy ways with it just so it's easy for me to see visually, and the next thing I'm gonna do is option click to add a control point and drop it back down to this unity line where no effect is being had because I don't really want this push to span the entirety of the blue uh, curve. I really only want it to affect this narrower region of shadows toward the bottom. 
So I've option clicked to create this control point, and now by holding down option, I can drag left or right and kind of find the right choke point that looks good to me visually. So that's the beginning of my split toning for the bottom. Next, because I don't want a pure blue push in my shadows, I wanna make it a bit more of a cyan -y push, I'm gonna to go to my green channel and do a similar thing to what I just did with the blue, but just less of it. So I'm gonna grab another control point here, nudge up, not nearly as far as I did with the blue, and again, option click to add a control point and choke it in somewhere around where I set my blue choke point. So now I've got the bottom portion of my split toning in place. But before this makes sense and before we can really evaluate it, we need to set up the top as well. We need to get our warm push into the highlights. So next we're gonna to go to our red channel and I'm gonna grab another control point and push it upward just like I did for the first two channels. You'll notice that the red channel tends to be much more touchy than the blue and green, at least perceptually. So it can be a little tricky to find the perfect spot for it just using your mouse and freehanding your control points here. But we don't need to worry about doing that perfectly because there's actually another way we're gonna look at in a moment of backing off the overall intensity of an adjustment per channel. So this is the right idea here, and I'm gonna follow this up with option clicking to create yet another control point, another choke point, so that again, my red channel, my push in the highlights here is not inadvertently poisoning the entirety of the red curve. So I'm gonna option click and park that somewhere near where I parked the choke points for my blue and my green channels. So I'm well on my way here, but my problem as we just identified is that the red push component of this is far too strong. You can see here visually, it's just gone too far and I've only moved this control point about two pixels up from where it started, and I simply don't have the motor control or the desire to sit here and noodle and try to dial it in perfectly using my mouse or my tablet. So instead of that, I'm gonna take a much better alternative and go over here and work my sliders. These sliders allow me to affect the overall intensity of whatever adjustment I've deployed over here simply by finding the right number. Now, the one thing that's important to note about these sliders is they don't operate exactly like you might think. For example, if I run this slider all the way to zero, I'm not zeroing out the result of my red channel adjustment over here, I'm actually inverting it. So instead of nudging a little bit of red into this tonal region, I'm nudging a little bit of cyan, red's opposite into the tonal region. So it's important to note that while these sliders run from zero to 100, zero in the sense of actually dialing out an adjustment fully doesn't live at zero, it lives at 50. So here at 50, this red channel adjustment that I've made is having no effect whatsoever. And of course, I don't want that. I simply want less than what I started with when I was getting 100 and things were looking downright washy, looking like there was a big red push throughout the entire image. So I'm gonna try parking somewhere around 65 and see how that feels. And even that honestly feels like it might be a hair strong. So I'm gonna back it off to 60. And I think that's a much more sensible spot for the upper end of my split toning formula here. Now we can flip this on and off and get a sense for what it's doing to our image. It's funny because when you dial it in in pieces and you're working in a, a nuanced way like this, you may or may not feel the adjustments as they're coming in and it may or may not feel like you've really done much until you turn it off. And then at least to my eye, I really miss it. And I think what I'm missing when I turn it off and what I like when I turn it on is the two things that we identified at the start of this video. The first being depth where shadowed areas just feel further away than better lit areas, middle to upper exposed areas. There's some nice depth happening there. And then separation as well, where the dominant colors in the frame have more contrast against one another. It's easier for my eye to read the image. The image becomes more legible, which is fundamentally a pleasing experience. So again, off and on, it's not night and day, but it's a significant improvement, and it's one that you're gonna reap the benefit of on shot after shot after shot because it's being deployed at a global level in your overall look. So again, if I'd had the desire to, I could have gotten this same result by nudging my individual channels within my custom curve over here in this original curve node. But by doing it in a separate node, I can audition my split toning and my overall Luma curve component separately. And I can continue to fine tune those things throughout my project without worrying about inadvertently bumping another attribute that I'm not trying to mess with at all. 
So the last thing I'm gonna do here for organizational sake is start to label my components because we're gonna to continue to add more and things are gonna get more and more confusing. So I'm gonna label this one curve and I'm gonna call this one split and I'm now in an ideal position to continue to add layers of global look attributes in the rest of our series. With the refinements we've made today, our look is really starting to come together and to give us a consistent feel across all of our shots. We're now ready to tackle the finer details that really make or break a great look. Now, if you're a busy independent filmmaker or a content creator or post-professional, you may not always have time to build a look from scratch like we're doing today. For these situations, I've developed Coloid, a set of DaVinci Resolve plugins which allows you to quickly develop a look without the hit or miss black box quality that you get with a LUT. Everything is fully adjustable and fully under your control. If you'd like to learn more or grab a free 24 hour trial, check out the link above, which I'm also gonna leave down below in the description. And if you've enjoyed this series thus far, be sure to check out part three, where we're gonna use color theory to create a harmonized palette for our images. See you then.